This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 318. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? This is Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host, the man of the hour, the man of the year, David Green. What's up, buddy? Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm doing wonderful. I'm actually looking to hire a new intern for the David Green team. So I've been going over oh, resumes and getting people to email me uh, and then trying to systemize everything that we're doing. So we're, we've got someone who's running my rental portfolio. I'm looking to step up my flip business and uh, looking for an analyst to help with multifamily stuff. So I'm stepping up my game in 2019 and looking to bring people in to teach. How's things over there on your end? Well, not too bad. Uh, speaking of hiring. So I was thinking the other day, I was talking to some buddies of mine who call me call, call. We basically had this conversation about at the end of the day, like one of the most important skills a person could have in all of like real estate or business or in anything really that you want to grow larger than yourself, like knowing how to hire a good employee, like bringing good team members, like finding talent is the most important skill you can really have. Like, because at the end of the day, if you want to grow bigger than yourself, you have to find talent and talent is hard to find. Anyway, so in that conversation, one of the guys asked me, they're like, well, do you ever like read a book on hiring? And I'm like, no, I've read a million books on real estate, but I've never read one on hiring. Why not? So anyway, I just read one called Who. It's pretty good. All about like, here's a system for hiring. I'm like, oh, weird. Like, we have a problem and there's, I bet you some guy's got it figured out. Some guy's got it figured out. Anyway, so I'm big on hiring, but it actually leads to today's quick, quick tip. I mentioned this last week. I'll say it again this week. Bigger Pockets is hiring for a couple of different roles in the marketing team. Last time I talked about retention, a person that's going to be working on pro retention, which is like working with our pro members to deliver value. Uh, we're also hiring a just a, a pro, we'll call, I don't even know what you call it, a pro or Bigger Pockets plus pro sales marketing consultant person, whatever. I don't know if there's an official role title yet for it. Anyway, go to biggerpockets.com slash jobs if you are in Denver or willing to move to Denver and you want to work very closely with the marketing team, including myself, because I am the head of the Bigger Pockets pro team. So, anyway, if that's you, go to biggerpockets.com slash jobs and do what it says. With a cool opportunity to work in what you love. Right. Yeah. Very, very cool. And it's really fun. Bigger Pockets is such a cool place. Their office in Denver is amazing. Like, it's amazing. So, it's probably the coolest office I've ever seen anywhere ever. Now, it's time to get to today's show. So, today's show is a ton of fun. We're interviewing a guy named Colin Schwartz. Colin has an amazing story. I mean, he, two years ago, he was listening to the Bigger Pockets podcast, just like you're listening to right now, right? He went, learned stuff from the podcast and from others and started meeting people, networking, reading. And two years later now, he has over a hundred units and including, he, he bought like six of them right on his first direct mail campaign. You're going you're gonna to be blown away by his numbers. Uh, very, very cool story. Uh, he talks a lot about that, talks a lot about what it takes to be really successful, uh, how he ran out of money around the 20 unit mark and how he got through that. He talks about deal flow, property management, and like so much more. Y'all going to love this stuff. Just tons of gold in here. So take some notes. You're going to love it. So without further ado, Let's get to today's show with Colin Schwartz. Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Podcast. Colin, how you doing? Great. How are you, buddy? Man, I'm doing I'm doing good. This is gonna be fun talking about your story, real estate, all that good stuff. So why don't we start at the beginning? How did you get into real estate? So yeah, just just kind of some background on me. I'm 34 years old, live in Omaha, Nebraska, married, got two young kids. Um, the, the, the moment that I knew I was going to be a real estate investor was kind of one of those pivotal moments. And like lots of people, I picked up the book, rich dad, poor dad. This was January 1st, 2017. I remember exactly where I was last day of vacation, um, kind of dreading going back to my cubicle. And I picked that book up and immediately I had this mind shift. I finished the book within two days and I knew that I had to start making a change. Otherwise, I was going to be that individual at 64 years old, staring at his Vanguard account, praying that the market doesn't crash and that I can retire next year. Uh, it, it really hit me, hit me like a ton of, ton of bricks. Um, my wife was pregnant with her second child, so I knew my 10 days of vacation off a year was not going to cut it anymore. Um, sure. Anyways, started educating, started reading pretty much as much as possible. 
millionaire real estate investor, all those types of books. When you start reading those, kind of some of the big takeaways are to network, to go out, meet people. So I started doing that, started reaching out to numerous agents. These agents, you know, turned me on to bigger pockets, which then occupied my mornings. Nice. Every, every single morning with uh, Professor Turner and Professor Dorkin. <laughs> <laughs> On, on my that's drive, a, that's the okay. first and only time I think anyone will ever refer to me as professor. I'll, I'll take no, it. No, it's, it's great. No, but seriously, <laughs> it, uh, it, it had a tremendous impact on me. You know, listening to all these stories. But but anyways, going through it, I, I realized I had some finances. You know, I, I had some money saved away so that I would actually be able to invest and get better returns in the stock market. But the the challenge is is finding a property that's going to be worth anything. And I think. Uh, a lot of people realize, you know, you go on Zillow, you go on LoopNet, and the numbers usually aren't reflective um, of actuals. They're, you know, the pro formas or anything like that. So I did, I guess. I heard, what, I heard the other day, pro forma is Latin for lie. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that, yeah. that might be a true. <laughs> um, but anyways, I guess I did what any sane person does. Um, I pulled a list from list source and I told my wife, hey, honey, this weekend, we were going to handwrite 191 letters and, stuff <laughs> them and send them out to these owners. Um, so yeah, I, I did that. You know, this was about a, a month later after reading those books. I'm, I'm kind of one of those ready, ready fire aim people where I, I, I wasn't possibly being patient enough, but I wasn't getting the results from agents. You know, some of them would laugh at me. Some of them would be like, yeah, everybody's looking for, you know, a nice 10 cap property, 15 to 20% cash on cash returns. Um, anyway, sent those letters out and I was able to get six deals off of those letters. And no way. Yes, yes. And really that was one of the biggest catalysts for both confidence. Um, but yeah, just to actually get me started in investing. So that, that's kind of where my, my, my journey began. Um, since then, wow. started a, a meetup group, a networking group. Um, actually, Mindy's been out to one of them as well when she was down for the Berkshire event, Mindy Jensen. So yeah, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of how it started. All right. So I want to I wanna dig in on the six deals. I mean, mo I know people who have sent thousands of letters and not got a deal. I mean, I, I sent a couple of years ago, I always tell the story of how I bought my daughter's fourplex. I sent out 300 letters and got back like 40 phone calls, got one deal, 191 letters and six deals. What did you do right? Or what did you do wrong? That got <laughs> so that's, that's funny. It's uh, I get that question a lot, you know, what's in the letter. Um, and I'd be happy to, to go over and tell yeah. everybody what it is. It's, it's no real secret sauce. I found some properties in specific areas that I liked. Um, they needed to be located next to my work so that I could go service them on my lunch break, before work, after work. Um, you know, I was running errands over my lunch breaks. That, that was kind of what I had to do. Um, but anyways, I identified the certain zip codes. I identified that the individuals had owned the property for more than five years. That would hopefully increase the likelihood of them wanting to sell. Um, and then I filtered down to multifamily. From there, I actually, I, what, what I wanted to do was I know a lot of people do send off letters. I know a lot of people send postcards. Um, and I know every single postcard I get, I throw in the trash. Every piece of junk mail I get, I throw in the trash. Sure. So I figured if I'm actually handwriting, you know, the sender's address, I actually put my real home address on there. I figured I'm kind of intersecting myself into these people's lives and saying, Hey, I know you own this. I want to buy it. Some people take a lot of offense to that, which, which is okay. But I know anybody that's done direct mail has gotten kind of that, those hate calls. Why, why are you sending me this? Sure. Um, but I just put in kind of, you know, a sincere saying, you know, Hey, I'm a, I'm an investor. I'm looking to purchase your property. I'm not a real estate agent. I didn't put anything about being able to buy in cash because that wasn't my intent. My intent was to go through bank financing. Um, and, and I think that really set the conversation up a, a little bit better than if I would have just done, you know, the typical postcard route. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, there's a lot of people who are just doing the, 
I don't know what you call it, like the, the, the shotgun approach or, you know, or you just like blast out hundreds and hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of letters. And that obviously works. We've had people on the show before who are doing that, but you took a much different approach. You said, how can I send a smaller amount of letters and really just get these to agree? You know, like how do I, how do I really make myself a real person stand out, appear different? Say five years own multifamily. Uh, so you were looking at multifamily straight off the bat, right? Straight off the bat. So I, I think, you know, Listening to your podcast and everything, I, I know lots of individuals would think more units, more risk. Um, in, in my mindset, more units, less risk. You know, you can have 10 units, one vacant versus, you know, the single family home route where yeah. if you have one vacant, you're basically paying the mortgage that month. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. So, all right. You sent these letters. Uh, what, what kind of multifamily were they? Single? I mean, I mean like duplexes, triplexes or larger? They were, they were primarily duplexes, fourplexes. Um, I, I was able to get a sevenplex out of it. Um, but yeah, b- basically anything that I could see that had value add opportunity, rents way too low, and that I knew that I could go in, maybe make some changes and increase those rents. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so a lot of people tell me, they, they, they ask this question, well, what if I make multiple offers and get more than one deal accepted? You know, now I'm, I'm screwed because now I got two good options, right? You had six options out of that first deal. How did you, how did you put that together? Uh, ready, fire, aim, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, I ended up meeting a, a gentleman through networking. He had owned and uh, managed 50 units. So I started talking with him. He really helped guide me through the process and said, hey, you know, if you find these things and their deals, we're, we're going to figure them out. Um, So yeah, I did have, so the process to get those six deals probably took five months or so, you know, back and forth with some of them, but three of them were immediately. Um, I just realized that they were, they were good opportunities. And I guess my mind was fully into this, that this is what I wanted to do, that that's what I had to do. Um, But yeah, he really helped guide me through, you know, I could call him, I probably sent him, I don't know. 5,000 text messages in the first two months asking <laughs> every single question about being a landlord, you know, the type of lease to use, what do you think of these people, what do you think of this, contractors, all those recommendations. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it, uh, it, it, never, it never really occurred to me. I mean, I, I definitely got overwhelmed and, and probably, uh, probably still do as I'm constantly getting properties under contract and, you know, always, always wonder, you know, how am I going to make this one yeah. work? especially when you're closing on one. Um, but, but what I've realized, if, there's, uh, if the property really is a deal, th- there's usually a way to figure it out. Um, and of those six deals, I actually did wholesale one and flip another. So oh, cool. that was able to bring in some additional income um, to kind of offset what, what might have been the additional responsibilities for me because I was and still am managing the properties. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So let's talk about financing these properties. And I know we'll move on to the rest of your portfolio, but I just, it's a cool story of like, you know, these first six. So when you got that, did you just go to run to a bank right away when they started coming in and you started getting these deals accepted or how did you work financing? No. So, um, so the first deal didn't close till about May, you know, going through due diligence back and forth and everything. So one of the first things I did after the education was realize what the finances what is my finances? What, what is, what is my gunpowder? What, what can I actually do? So I reached out to four different banks, um, two of them being local, one in which I banked with and one just kind of big name bank. I wanted to get the gambit of what I could actually do. Um, so no, I actually had the pre-approvals. I was ready to go with those, um, yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that was kind of, it, it was a lot of preparation on the front end because it, it think, you know, I, I couldn't go and buy a $5 million property at sure. that time. There's no finances for that. So I wanted to know actually what I could buy, what the bank's risk tolerance was, what, what they would think of a person who's never invested in real estate before, whose family doesn't invest in real estate, who, you know, sits at a cubicle and doing IT work, what, what they were comfortable giving me and what yeah. types of terms. Okay. So 
I think that's smart. You know, there's that famous quote from, uh, uh, I think it was Abe Lincoln, though everything's subscribed to Abe Lincoln on the internet, right? But like, it basically says, if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four sharpening my ax, right? right? Or something like that. It's like about preparation, right? And I think that's so key is like getting prepared before you get into real estate, like getting the pre-approval lined up, getting your financing kind of figured out, getting the education front loaded. But on the other side of that equation is people who just prepare all day long and they spend nine hours sharpening an ax and then realize the tree is still standing. So like, how do you balance between the two? And what would you tell a newbie listening to the, about getting prepared versus being too prepared? You know, what's funny is I'm sitting down and, you know, I've been doing scrambling over taxes and uh, meeting with my bookkeeper and everything. And looking back, I probably would have changed a hundred different things. Um, <laughs> you know, just, just, just <laughs> setting up of everything. Um, you don't realize what, what, what scale you're going to go to. You, you don't realize any of that. But what I can say is that if, if you put yourself out there and you actually do go through the deal and, and you, you have the mindset that you want to do this, you will be able to figure it out. You're just going to have to continue to reach out to people. But putting yourself in those uncomfortable positions, it, you will typically be able to find your find your way out. Now you're going to make mistakes. Uh, obviously you could prepare for two years, but if I had sat there, I mean, I think about it, it's about two years since I started. If I had prepared this whole time and got everything perfect, my structures, everything like that, you know, I might've, I might've lost the desire to do it and might not have done it. So yeah, I, I really think you have to go ahead. You have to do it. It's, it's okay to prepare, but you know, Instead of going out, talking to the attorney, getting your LLC, you know, setting up your software, making sure that you have all these different, different, every single piece in place. It's really important just to get out there and have some fundamentals and be willing to put the extra effort in. Well, that's how growth happens. We always, I wouldn't say we always, but oftentimes we want everything to be all our ducks lined up in a row before we take the first step. But the reality is things are built in phases. It's kind of messy the way it goes. So, you know, you often won't know who your contractor is going to be until you've got a couple of deals to look at. You have to go through bids and the, the contractor you first use won't be the guy you end up with. And it's not so you do a couple of deals that then you get credibility and you start a meetup and now you meet people at the meetup that have better contractors and the whole thing builds that way. So you sent out some mailers, you got some houses under contract and you started this meetup. Can you, can you tell us, Colin, where are you at right now? How many units do you own? I have 110 units. Whoa. Okay, how many, that's a lot. How many properties is that spread out over? Yeah, in two years. So it's about 20 properties. Um, I don't own them all myself. Typically, it's a 50-50 partnership. About, I think, 14. I just closed on two duplexes on Friday. 14 of the units I, I own solely, um, but the rest of them are, are in partnerships, 50-50 partnerships. Now, this is an odd question, but are you happy with owning 110 units or do you feel like you would have done it differently if you could go back and do it again? Like if, if I would have bought better performing or if I would have... Uh, yeah, maybe better performing units or different kinds of units. Like, are you happy with having a whole lot of houses or do you feel like that was an inefficient way to do it? Just for the people who are like, wow, I want to go do that. Do you think that's the best way to do it? You know, for me it was, and the reason being is... I really wanted to get out of my job. My job wasn't terrible by any means. It was a good job. You know, everybody would look on it. You know, it, it paid well. It was, it was a good job. But for me to get out, I needed to supplement my income. And, and the way in which I've, I've done that is become the property manager for these properties, take a property management fee in which I partner with. So that has allowed my income to grow to that level. Um, to say I would have done it differently, I really don't think so. I, okay. I think I'm pretty happy with how, how I've done it. So what about, uh, how did you start finding properties after the direct mail campaign? Have you, has it been word of mouth through the networking stuff you talk about? It, it absolutely has. Um, the next property, what one of my partners, he actually brought it to me. It was an 11 unit. Um, another partner brought me a 24 unit, which we partnered on. So really I've had lots of wholesalers reach out to me. Um, it, it is kind of that, that exponential curve where at first you are literally grinding, grinding, grinding. Yeah. And you don't think you're going to get any deals. Nobody's giving you the time of day. You really have no credibility. And once you start doing those deals, the deals do find you. Yeah. I love that. And, and a lot of people do struggle a lot and you learn little things along the way too. Like that. you like, I mean, like you, 
that you weren't doing in the beginning when you thought you were hustling really, really hard. But in the beginning, you're usually hustling on stuff that probably doesn't matter, right? Like, man, I've been spending 18 hours a day designing this business card and I'm not getting any details, right? Like, exactly. Exactly. My website looks so good, but you know, they're not getting any deals. All right. So you get out there, you, you started working at it. You, I mean, a hundred, over a hundred units in two years. It's amazing. And you said you did it through partnerships and, and you said that almost like a, like you were, I don't want to call it apologizing, but you were like, oh, well it's not all, you know, it's partnerships, right? But that's amazing. Like you enabled other people now to invest in real estate as well. You're working with other people. You're helping other people build wealth at the same time. So I want to talk about partnerships because I am a huge huge fan of partnerships, right? Uh, I talk about them a lot. So how, I mean, let's talk about how do you typically structure a partnership? Uh, what does that look like? What are they bringing? What are you bringing? And does that change over time or? Yeah. Let's yeah. About yeah. So the partnerships, it's really uh, j- just a 50, 50 structure. We, we, we share in, we share in all the cash flow, everything. Um, it's, it's very much equal partnerships. I do the management yet. We're both responsible for, I mean, overseeing the property, getting the property to close, um, you know, whether it's setting up insurance, whether we're, we're meeting with vendors, whether we're just challenging each other to, to look at the property. I, you know, my partners, we, we talk all the time and like, well, why is this expense this? Or maybe we should change our snow removal company. Maybe we should use this lawn care company. Maybe we should institute this rubs program. Um, so really it is a, it is a partnership as the individuals I am partnered with are, they are working a full-time job, or at least two of them are, but they are very much hundred percent vested and invested in wanting to be real estate investors full-time. Can That's you all. define rubs for us? Uh, rent, utility, <laughs> bill, back system. Yeah. Basically, um, when a, when a landlord is paying for water, gas, and sewer is a typical one, he can take that total amount of the amount that I pay and he bills that back to the tenant. So basically, it's, it's, reducing it. it's like using an algorithm to figure out who pays how much as opposed to putting in a meter where you just get a number, basically. It, it, exactly, exactly. So it's usually done in arrears. So you spend $2,000 a month on water, gas, sewer. The next month, you bill back the 20 units, you know, 100 bucks each. Yeah. Thank you. Have you found that's also a really good way for individuals if they're underwriting properties and they're like, well, I can't increase the rents, you know, everything's kind of stagnant. Look at what the the landlord is paying for. If the yeah. landlord's paying, lots of these older landlords are just yep. paying for water, gas, and sewer just because that's the way they've always done it. They don't know these systems exist. But that, that can significantly increase your income. That that can be the value add right there. Yeah, typically when I look at a rental property, there there are actually very few things you can control. I mean, like you can't really control the taxes. They are what they are. I mean, before you buy it, of course, but once you buy it, like there's not a lot you can do except for utilities. Uh, like they're often the largest lever and vacancy. If you could fix those two things, typically, I mean, again, you're not going to jack the rent up 500 a month and hope that people will pay it. They just won't. It's market dependent. But yeah, utilities can be a great way, but you can't always rubs, right? So, and, and shift the payment. So how do you, I guess, first of all, what area are you buying in? And you probably said that earlier, but if not, what area are you buying in? And, and then like, have you always been able to do that? Uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. And so and- typically the, the units that I buy, the, the, the meters are already split out. But for example, this one, um, one of our most recent purchases, a 24 unit that, that was really where the value add came. You know, we were able to increase the rents five, six, 7%. But to be able to reduce our expenses by fifteen hundred dollars a month and bill those back to the tenants, that 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 was that was huge. We we actually use a a company and what they do is they'll send off the invoices and people can just mail in their checks or pay online. That's cool. Do you know what they're called off the top of your head? Uh, Invoice America. Okay. Might as well give them a shout out. That's cool. Um, all right. So that's, that's awesome. Again, yeah. Great way to increase your income by, by reducing expenses that way. Uh, I want to go back real quick to the partnership thing. I'm curious, are you guys each really equally putting in like both partners, the money or are you, they just doing the money and you're doing other parts or how do, how do you break that out? So I, I guess that that varies on the front end, not necessarily that there's been some deals where I've shown up with $0, yeah. uh, but we do a promissory note and I pay that money back or at the refinance. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Or, I mean, but typically the amount of equity invested is equal. Um, there, there are some instances 
that really helped me because I basically ran out of money at, you know, maybe the 15 or 20 unit mark. There was yep. money goes, capital goes really quick in this business. So I would find these additional off market properties and I would add acquisition fees. So yep. at closing, if I'm acting as, you know, I don't want to say the realtor, but if I'm acting as the, the agent between myself, my partner and the uh, seller, that I would throw in, you know, a two, 3% acquisition fee. And that would help me finance the properties as well. That's cr- That's cool. I mean, I hear that with syndicators from time to, I mean, all the time, right? If you, if you go syndicate a 200 unit apartment yep. complex, there's a one, two, 3% fee on there. Almost always. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a deal that didn't have that, right? So why not? I mean, if, if that's what you work out with your partner and that's part of your value you're bringing to the table, why not do it? I think that's an awesome idea. Yeah, so it, it, it'd almost be similar um, you know, when, when I did recently, rather than, you know, wholesaling the property, the individual wanted to get in, we partnered on it. But at closing, I still took a, you know, $5,000 assignment fee for that, yep. for, for running the deal, working with it for, you know, six, seven months, um, kind of putting all the pieces together, working with the banks and all that. Cool. So how do you find your partners? Um, you know, it, it's really networking and, you know, we, we, we have to build... So partners, you know, it's definitely a lot like a relationship. You want to make sure that you guys are on the same wavelengths, but that, that you also bring, bring strengths to each other. So typically, I mean, just sharing things in common. Um, one of them I met actually through bigger pockets. Uh, we were competing. So we kept competing on deals together. We kept showing up at showings together and we kept competing. And, you know, we had talked for probably a year before then and we're just like, how about we just, uh, just think about partnering and sit down and really figure this out. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of been, you know, it's just actually, networking. It's actually fascinating. The idea of like, find your biggest competitor, like in your area, find somebody who's just doing a really good job and partner with them. Cause two people should be able to, if they're both good, two people should be able to do the work of 10 if they're yeah. working. And I could just tell, you know, uh, for instance, he was, he was just a hustler. He, he was out there. I mean, we, we, we were on phone conversations. I mean, we'd spend hours on the phone, you know, just talking about real estate and we just kept showing up at these deals together. We te- kept talking about these other deals and, uh, you know, finally we we're just like, what are we doing here? You know, he's working his full-time job. I'm doing the management. You know, we both got along really well. We both had some, some opposing, but, but very good strengths. Um, and, you know, very open with each other. We're like, let's just, let's just partner on one of these and see how it goes. And yeah, it, it's been great. It's funny you say that because I'm in a very similar situation with another realtor, a good friend of mine. He sells an insane amount of houses. He's really, really good at being a realtor. He has incredible systems in place. Pretty much all the things that me as a guy two years in is trying to build, right? And eventually I will get that foundation laid and like any skyscraper, when there's a foundation laid, you shoot up really fast, right? Um, But he doesn't want to shoot up. He doesn't want, he doesn't want to have to like throw gas on the fire and, and recruit new agents and train people and get new leads coming in. He just works his old referral business that he's had and he's got this really good system in place that he doesn't want to go faster. And I want to go faster, but I don't have a system in place that can support that speed. Like my car would fall apart on the track. And we're talking about the exact same thing. It's so funny you say that rather than seeing him as competition, we're fighting over the same listings. It's if we put this together and build this super team, it gives every other realtor a place to go where they're going to get better training and systems and they can succeed better. And you've turned an enemy into a friend. And I'm sure there's some Chinese proverb that says that really cool that I'm not (laughs) not quoting right now, but that's what you want to do. One of the things that he likes about me, and this is a good segue is that I host these meetups in the Bay area where I teach people how to invest in real estate and it's all free. I get quite a big following, probably like 120 people that come. I'm I'm starting to do one a week in different locations throughout the Bay and these meetups are growing really quickly and it gives people a chance to meet me. It gives me, a chance to get to know people. It's good for business and it's good for them. I know you're doing the same thing. So can you tell us for the people who are listening that either want to go to a meetup or maybe want to start a meetup, what's some things they should know about how to do it and how has that positively impacted your investing business? Yeah. So when people think of meetups, you know, I think this also goes to how people can hesitate to start because they think they need to have all the pieces in place. How I started the meetup is I was on this Facebook group and I saw people keep kept talking about real estate investing. Well, at the time I was rehabbing a fourplex. So I just posted on the group, guys, I'm going to be at this fourplex Thursday night. Want to bring a six pack and come check it out. 12 people showed up, you know, it, it, it was a good turnout. So from there we did it at a buddy's house who just rehabbed a house. From there, it really doesn't have to be a super formal thing. Just showing, just providing some value and uh, 
I don't know, having something interesting really, really helps. Um, from there, we actually started doing it at a, at a bar. Um, so we do have meetups in town. They're more of the high school gymnasium PowerPoint type meetups. Um, I wanted a place where I could go out on a Wednesday night and go have a beer um, and talk real estate with a bunch of guys, a bunch of guys and gals. Um, so yeah, I, I really designed it kind of around what I wanted and it, it turned out that a lot of other people wanted that yeah. as well. That's cool. I, I am a huge proponent, as everyone who listens to the show knows, of these meetups, right? We do them out here in Maui. I did them in Washington. I know David's got his almost every week now, right? Like getting, and, and it's, sometimes it can be a professional PowerPoint type thing if, if that's the purpose of the meetup. And sometimes like it's just get together for drinks on the beach or whatever, right? Like, I mean, uh, like it's getting together networking. Like if you want to be, if you want to get in shape, if you want to be fit, go hang around with a bunch of really in shape fit people and you'll just naturally become more like them. If you want to be a good real estate investor, get around a bunch of really good real estate investors or others who are passionate about it and you're naturally going to find yourself climbing there as well. And of course, we have a, a place, everyone listen to this, if you haven't checked it out yet, biggerpockets.com slash events, E-V-E-N-T-S, you can actually create an event and host, a, a, you know, find a bar in your area, a beach or a park or a restaurant or whatever, go to Red Robin, get some good burgers and just like, hey, I'm going to be here at this time or go to one of your properties like you did. That's a cool, I love when meetups do that, meetup properties because you get to talk to people and it's a good way to potentially find partners, to find lenders, to find people to work with, to share contract information. There's just so much good about meetups. So yeah, go to biggerpockets.com slash events. Look there. If there's an event in your area, go to it. If there's not an event in your area or it's lame, <laughs> start your own, right? Like be the hub. Yeah. So, so a couple of things I didn't touch on. Um, the, the other meetups in town do charge. I didn't want to start one in charge. It was yeah. just, you know, I just wanted to network with other people. And yeah. what I found is that people wanted to start speaking at these meetups, whether it's promoting their business, um, or just, you know, giving back, you know, being that, that center person, you know, they put a presentation together, they were working on their business. So they'd come and present for, you know, half hour, 45 minutes. So that really helped the following as well. So as far as structure, it's typically, you know, an hour of networking, no more than an hour of presentation and slash questions, and then networking for the rest of the night. Um, we have, you know, email groups and we post on bigger pockets and all that. Um, but yeah, it's been a lot of, lot of word, word of mouth. Also, I was able to find a buddy who was part owner of a bar. So I was able to use their space rather than paying the 250, 500 bucks. I said, Hey, I'm going to bring this, these many people. Well, sure enough I did. And it became one of their biggest, largest nights that they would have um, just from the group. So yep. they were happy to accommodate us. Um, so that we did not have to pay them anything so that we could still keep the event for free. Yeah, that's cool. So I, I know that. you got a lot of deals out of your meetup, right, Colin? So can you give us an idea? What do you look for in a deal? What's your, what's your quick analysis that makes you say, hey, this is something I might want to look into? Yeah, so um, the, the location of the property is, you know, paramount. Um, I, I don't invest in D areas, you know, higher crime, you know, higher issue areas. Typically, I'm looking in, you know, B, B minus, C plus areas, um, typically more in the B areas. And I'm looking for properties that are probably more in the, in the C level um, as far as condition that I know that I can bring up. Also, I want them to be, they don't have to be, but typically this is where you find the good deal, grossly mismanaged, um, rents way below. And I look to see that I'm going to be able to at least hopefully burr out of the property um, mm -hmm. buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Um, so basically go through that process to pull my cash back out and that it's still going to cash flow well after that I do, after I do refinance it. Now you, you do the Burr method with money though. You don't use cash. So you go in with financing, you buy it with a down payment and then you refinance after. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So that tell us how you're able to add enough value through a property that you use financing to get your cash back out. Yeah, so one of them was super interesting that we just did. It was a fourplex. Um, trying to think, we, we purchased it about seven months ago. It was, rents were 40, 50% under what they should have been. I went in when we purchased the property. As I said, we did use bank financing. The, we went in and increased the rents. Everybody left. Nobody was going to pay the new rents. They had been there for 20 years and were paying half the amount. Super popular area of town. 
we went in, we did a little bit of repairs, you know, we made the units a bit nicer, updated some electrical, um, some ACs, got new residents in nearly immediately, um, and were able to pull all of our money back out in about three and a half months. So that's typically that. what that's, that's typically what I'm doing is using the the bank financing though. Yeah. And are these loans that you're using like typical Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac? I mean, if you're doing it in three months, you're probably not getting typical financing. Are these uh, portfolio lenders? These are local yeah, portfolio commercial lenders. So, you know, they, they typically <laughs> balloon after five years, you know, the, the total amounts due or you get a reprice um, yeah. and that they're amortized over 20 years. Typically rates are higher than, you know, residential Fannie Freddie. Um, mm -hmm. But the speed and the agility um, yeah. and the flexibility of them it has really allowed me to do a lot of things in, in like an effective fashion. Any tips Good. for finding lenders like that? Uh, well, first off, go, I mean, reach out to your network, see if anybody has any recommendations. Um, I, I really like the local banks, but I think I've talked to probably seven or eight banks total. I, I think it really is, you know, make sure that you're comfortable with them. Also knowing if somebody else has done business with those individuals. Um, some bankers will tell you, promise you the world. And then, Kind of in the final hour, the eleventh hour, they'll say, "Oh, sorry, we, we can't get this done for you." You know, your your debt to income's a little out of whack. Um, so I, I think, I mean, j just as like finding a partner or anything, it, it's just really building trust. You know, it's building trust with those individuals. Does it worry you at all, like having the shorter, like the balloon payments? Like if you got to pay this thing off in five years, does it worry you? And what do you do to pro to to hedge your risk against that? So, yes, of course it does. I, I would say it worried me a bit more at first. Um, most importantly, I, I try to factor in an additional buffer of both the value add, even after I refinance, but also the ability to have rents decrease as well, that I'm kind of in that middle range. I'm not high end A class. I'm not, you know, in the, in the D level. I'm, I'm kind of in that comfortable area where you can get people that may have to move down from a class to move into this property. So, so there is some obviously inherent risk, but I try to have enough value into the properties. And plus I'm not spending the cash flow. Typically I, I'm saving the cash flow, whether it's to reinvest. And then these properties are continuing to rent and bring in more rental income. Um, so obviously there is a lot of leverage, but I, I always keep a large CapEx on, on hand for each property. Um, just in case, you know, a roof goes or when a roof goes, when a furnace goes, but yeah, there, there's obviously some inherent risk and, you know, we're kind of at that, that level in the cycle where everybody's kind of tiptoeing, waiting for when it's going to fall. But for me, if I didn't do this, I was going to be doing the same thing for the next 30 years. So yeah. the, the, the risk is, uh, you know, it's there, but it's not as bad as, you know, you know, sitting behind a desk for the next 30 years, you know, wishing yeah. I had done something. Yeah, people often, people often will look at real estate investors and say, you know, isn't that risky? And I, I, we look at people with jobs, we're like, isn't that risky? Like, it's and like every one of my coworkers, I think, you know, they're like, oh, that's, that's so risky. You know, you're, you're jumping in. And yeah. uh, honestly, I mean, the, the amount of income streams, you know, from these properties and, and everything is just, you, you, you see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Yep. Yep. That's fantastic. I, I really, really, really enjoy like that story. I love it. You started with, you know, rich dad, poor dad, like a lot of us do and jumped in, started listening to the podcast, just did what other people are doing. Hey, direct mail seems to work. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to try to do it the best I can. Got a bunch of properties, built up the system. Uh, and then you just figured things out on the way. I mean, it's just like the perfect story. So where do you see yourself headed now in the future? Um, so that's a, that's kind of a, that's a good question. You know, it's, if I look back two years, I would never guess that I'd be talking to you guys or have 110 units. That's just not, you know, that's that it's really cool. And I think, you know, we, we sometimes underestimate what we can do. What do they say? You underestimate what you can do in five years, overestimate yeah. what you can do in a year. Yep. Um, but looking to still acquire more, but really build up a solid property management company for my portfolio and for my partners. I want to have the best customer service at the level that I do. I want to have the best properties for the best value. I, I think, you know, especially when you're buying some of these properties from the old landlords, they see cash come in every month, you know, they put it in their pocket and that, that that's kind of it. It's, you know, finding a tenant and forgetting about it. 
for me, I really want this to be a successful business and a reflection of kind of, you know, my 12 years working in different industries and, and coming to this point. So yeah, it's, it's really just building the portfolio, continuing to grow, um, you know, having it be more systematized. I've hired a few people this year, such as, you know, a bookkeeper accountant. She's awesome. It, if you, obviously you probably know better than I do, but paperwork gets awful. So that was the first thing I needed to get off my list. But yeah, just continuing to build um, and really getting things systematized and feeling better about all of it. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, like that's really, there's like different phases in people's investing, right? In the beginning, you just like acquire what you can, build your portfolio, get some stuff, quit your job. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, now I got to manage all this. Like my wife and I went through the same thing. Now we got to systematize this. Let's hire some people. Let's make this a, a well-run business. And the cool thing about property management, you know, that you're managing these properties and you said you want to be the best customer service. The bar is really low. Like it's really <laughs> low, right? And so like, if you answer, you say contractor, right? If you answer your phone, you're in the top 10%. It's like yeah. with property manager. If you answer your phone with a smile, you're in the top 10%. Instead of like, what do you want? Nah, you know, like. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the bar is low, so. That's a quick tip. Look for something in life to be good at where the bar is super low. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I, mean, I love that because it is. That's, I mean, I think that's why I've done so good as a realtor, to be honest, in the first Yeah, the bar is pretty low. <laughs> like the competition is so <laughs> pathetic, man. I'm like, the cleanest shirt and the dirty laundry. It's not hard to, to be really good. But to Brandon's point about how like you start off one way and it becomes something else, that's true for all business, right? And we really see it in real estate investing. And I think that investors get discouraged because they think like, how could I ever do what that guy's doing? But if you just think about a human body, how it starts as, you know, like an embryo and then it, it slowly becomes more complex until it becomes a, a fully developed human being that then continues to grow and get bigger that's how businesses are. It starts with one cell that's doing everything. And it's very first split into two cells would be like, you know, your first partnership, you hire out some stuff and then each of those cells splits into two more. And with every one of those splits, each cell becomes more specified and, and defined and, uh, like highly trained in one little area. And eventually it splits off into so many pieces that you're only doing that part that you really like and enjoy doing. And that's where you get a guy like Colin, who's like happy about real estate investing and they're not frustrated and worked up. And like, like Brandon, you know, like you said, we've, we had to really systemize and make it a business. Well, you kind of turn it into a human being as opposed to just one big messy thing in the beginning. So be encouraged. <laughs> it will start off like rough, but with every, every step of growth, right? You get out of a little more of the stuff you dislike and you get better at the stuff you do. And eventually you get this really cool complex machine and, and it, it all works together. And you're in Hawaii, like Brandon hanging out and getting a tan and showing off your blue eyes to everybody that walks by you. I don't, I don't tan. Yeah. Or, or you're doing property management in Omaha where there's about two three inches of snow. <laughs> and on the you become ground. a snow angel like Colin. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Looking to get to Hawaii. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You bring yeah, up some well, good points though. But yeah, definitely the, you know, it, it may be all smiles about it, but, it, but it's, it's a ton of sacrifice and really find, I think what you said, finding where the bar is low because that's where nobody wants to go. Nobody wants to be a property manager. Yeah. Everybody here, oh, I want to invest passively. You know, they, they think of real estate as an event, not a process. They're going to buy 10 properties. It's going to cash flow 250 bucks a month. They're going to have $250, you know, but, but there's a lot of processes to it. Kind of what you said, you know, the, the whole analogy with the embryo and cells of, you know, it, it, it's ever evolving. It, it doesn't stop. So no, that's, that's a really good point. Well, cool. Well, hey, let's, let's shift gears over and dive a little deeper into your life with the deal deep dive. All right, let's get into the deal deep dive. This is the part of the show where we dive deep into one particular deal that you've done. That's a lot of D's. One particular deal that you've done. So let's do that today. Uh, number one, how, what with kind of David. Problem? With David, let's do that with David. All right, uh, number one, what kind of property are we talking about today? I'm going to continue with the D's duplex. Ooh, All right. I like hey. it, man. All right, David. How <laughs> did you find it? No, Direct no, no. mail. How, uh, David, you just ruined a perfectly good opportunity. How did you discover it? I, oh, 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 direct mail. Okay. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Oh, how many dollars was it? A hundred thousand dollars. 
<laughs> okay. How did you drive the seller to <laughs> give it to you? <laughs> so it was, uh, th- th- this was about six or seven back and forth phone calls. This was an owner occupied duplex. The guy owned it for 20 years. Um, basically said he wasn't in a hurry, but he was going to sell it to me at a good price. So I kept calling him every weekend when I said I would and uh, went and uh, went, and met, went and met him at his doorstep. And uh, yeah, we <laughs> signed a contract right then. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. All right. Uh, so uh, no, no, this is going off the rails. Uh, how did you uh, develop funding? <laughs> <laughs> so the... Farther. I've got nothing. Uh, so this, uh, this is a bank finance deal, twenty uh, percent down. Was that your deposit? No. <laughs> yes, the the twenty thousand dollars was the deposit towards the <laughs> good well, da- down payment. That's good. Oh, oh, even better, down payment. Good job, yeah, Brandon. That's why you're the host and I'm the co-host. What did you <laughs> do with it? <laughs> so basically, I had to turn all the units. Um, one of the tenants, the, the owner occupied left right away. The other side was trashed. Uh, people had lived there for 20 years. Um, they were paying 500 bucks a month in rent for four bed, one bath. Um, so went in, rehabbed that, put about $20,000 total, you know, throughout the process. Uh, this is also a real quick tip. When somebody shows up that wants to move into your properties, has cash and is ready to move in that day, run. Um, cause those were the first yeah. tenants I took and about six months later, I think, thankfully I signed a six month lease and numerous cop calls, drug overdoses. They were out of there. Um, I was about to sell that property for 140,000 and just be done with real estate investing. Anyways, I kept with it. I've got great residents in there and actually just refinanced it and it appraised at 205,000. So I was able to pull out $66,000. Wow. That's amazing. That's a nice. That's a nice deal there. All right. <laughs> David wants me to ask here, what was the disposition? But we already know that now. So I'm just going to end it with David. I'm, I'm stealing yours, David. What lesson did you discover from this deal? <laughs> <laughs> we are never doing this again. <laughs> no, it's terrible. Um, the, sorry. Um, <laughs> don't give up. I, I guess, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of mistakes in real estate yeah uh, but don't give up if i would have given up that could have been the end i i could have just just thrown in all thrown in my my bag of keys and just quit but just keep it keep working towards it and learn from your mistakes i make mistakes every single day every single day and sometimes i make 10 mistakes ask my wife i probably make more than that <laughs> um but but really just stick with it um and there there is a silver lining but it it's just not easy. It's, you know, it does take work, but yeah. And you can also make some mistakes in real estate. And I, I have found, and I think you say this, Brandon, that real estate is forgiving. Yeah. As long yeah. as you buy right. As long, yeah. Yeah. As long as you buy it. But even if you don't like, like I bought in bad deals that they end up usually over yeah. time, if you hold them long enough, they end up okay. It's forgiving. I mean, I'm not saying go buy bad deals, but it's forgiving. You hold things long enough. You're going to be probably okay over time. So well, that was uh, definitely a delightful deal deep dive. <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, let's head over to the next segment of today's show, the world famous Fire, fire round. round. It's time for the Fire Round. All right, let's get to today's Fire Round. These questions come direct out of the Bigger Pockets forums, and we're going to fire them at you. Right now, Colin, uh, are you prepared for this? I hope so. All right. Number one, from the forums. <laughs> I want to purchase my first <laughs> rental property. I know what city I want to invest in, but I want to narrow it down to a neighborhood. What kind of information should I look for when choosing a neighborhood? I guess I, w- I would ask, have they been to the city in the, the area that they want to go to? Um, you know, you want to look up crime stats. You want to pull up Zillow and look at average rents. You want to see a properties are selling? Are they single family homes that you're looking at? Are they multifamily properties? Um, call some property management companies, call some agents. But for me, especially if it's your first property, I would probably want to fly out there and see the neighborhood and, and judge for myself. All right. 
All right. Cool, cool. Next question. Joe from Kansas City says, I am considering starting a property management company. What are the important things I should know? Also, how do I find investors who need property managers to use as clients? So I guess I'm not sure if he's looking to do it as a third party because um, mine is for, for properties in which I own. Um, there is incredible demand for good property managers. So you, it should be pretty easy to find somebody yeah. that's looking for a property manager. You just want to have some good systems in place. Um, it also helps if you understand the invest in, investment aspect because you're going to be working with investors. So read as much as you can, get, get yourself into the investing community. And if you haven't, maybe go work for a property management company for just a little bit, shadow, see what their systems are, and then see how you can improve it because likely you can. Yeah. That's a great suggestion. I mean, why reinvent the wheel when a six month investment and getting paid could maybe, you know, six months to a year getting paid to learn somebody else's system. Yeah, that's cool. Isn't, that how, isn't that how Ryan Murdoch got started? Becoming an assassin? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Ryan Murdoch started with, uh, I mean, he started buying his own properties, then he became a property manager of his own deals. Then he started his own property management company. Then he ended up becoming, working for another property manager company. Now he is uh, a bigger yep. pockets. Yeah, he is. He's actually, uh, so those who don't know, Ryan Murdoch is now the newest Bigger Pockets team member. So, Ryan, you all heard him before. He's been on the podcast before. Congrats, he's, Ryan. Yeah, Ryan's now. Uh, he's like your know. muscle, basically, is what he yeah, is. Yeah, we call it. We call a kingpin, and he's like your goon. You're like, yeah, we. <laughs> that guy, I like, get him. We like mer mercenary better. It's like. The it's mer like a, I, Yeah, the mercenary. Yeah, the Mur Murdochsonary. So you're all going to probably hear from Ryan in the future, actually, because Ryan's going to start uh, interacting, especially with our pro members. So if you're a Pockets pro member, you'll probably hear a lot from Ryan. He's going to be involved, having conversations with pros, finding out ways to help pros even better. And hey, by the way, we're also hiring for another role, a couple of roles at Bigger Pockets right now. I think I mentioned it during the quick tip, but if not, because uh, I don't remember what today's quick tip was, but uh, basically we're hiring for a couple of roles in the marketing slash pro team. So if that's you, go to biggerpockets.com slash jobs. All right. Number three of the fire round. I'm currently looking to purchase my first rental and my agent sent me a list of tenant occupied homes for sale. I'm wondering what people think about tenant occupied homes. Would it be smart for a newbie to buy one or should I only buy a vacant one? Um, yes and no. It's, uh, I mean, what, what I always ask if I'm buying a property that has um, a current tenant in it is how long is the lease? Yeah. If the lease is, you know, two years and you walk in the property and they're paying half of what they should be and the property trashed, you probably want to pass on that because it's going to be hard to recover those costs in those first two years. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have some great inherited tenants, you know, that I've gone in, I've slightly increased their rent. They've been on month to month and it's worked out well. So it, it's very situational. All right. Thanks for that, Colin. Let's move along to the next segment of our show, the Famous Four. But first, let's hear from Mindy about who's going to be on the Bigger Pockets podcast, Money Podcast, on Monday. Hey, Brandon. Hi, David. On Monday's episode of the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, Scott and I talked to Rishon and Rob, a couple from Texas who nine years ago got married and discovered the Dave Ramsey book, The Total Money Makeover. They implemented a modified version of Dave's Baby Steps program and paid off $28,000 in student loans, both cars, and their $300,000 mortgage. But what's so interesting about their story is that it's not unique. It's totally repeatable for just about anyone if they adhere to the basic principles of spend less, save more, and invest wisely. Okay, guys, now it's back to you for the famous four. All righty. Thank you, Mindy, as always. Hey, y'all want to do something kind of cool? Go leave a rating and review for Mindy's show, for Mindy and Scott's show, The Money Podcast. They need some, they need some love. I mean, they're doing really good. They're actually growing faster than we grew, the Bigger Pockets podcast. Uh, but they could always use some love over on the rating and review side. So check them out, rate and review them. Let them know you love them. Let's get to the famous four. Number one, Colin, what's your favorite real estate related book? Uh, Dave Lindahl's Multifamily Millionaire. Great. Very like good one. His book, Emerging Markets, not bad either. Uh, next question. What is your favorite business book? So this one I just read and I, I've reread it twice is Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. It, it yeah. is phenomenal. Brandon, have you read that yet? I am three quarters of the way through the Audible. It's good. It's just long. Yep. So I haven't finished it. Yeah. But you know what I love about that? What do I love about that book? I think that show because I'm listening to it. What I love about it is it shows like 
like what entrepreneurship really takes, right? Like there's like this dream of entrepreneurship and, and this applies to real estate or anything. Like, like at the end of the day, like Phil Knight was, that's his name, right? Phil Knight? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Name? As, uh, for some reason I was thinking of Phil Collins because your name is Collins. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> Phil Knight, like the guy was obsessed. Like he was just obsessed and everything he did just push, 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 push for years to build up Nike. Uh, and it's kind of what like almost every successful person I've ever known has done. Like they get obsessed about their entrepreneurial venture and it's not just post on Instagram that you're an entrepreneur, hashtag entrepreneur, and suddenly you are, right? Like Brandon Turner and Josh Dorkin with bigger pockets, perhaps? <laughs> like Josh and then me later. We obsessed. Obsessed. Yeah, anyway. Right, Colin? Yes, sir. Obsessed? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Own your obsession. Yeah, super encouraging, though, uh, when, when uh, you see all the struggles that he went through, like two years yep. and up years and I'm like okay you know there, yeah. there is a light at the end of the tunnel so yeah I yep. won't ruin how the book ends but Nike's still around so <laughs> good <laughs> right on okay Colin what are some of your hobbies uh like to work out I do CrossFit love to travel um although I haven't been traveling ne- nearly as much as I would like um but yeah we took the kid out of Hawaii last year so we're, we got some more we're gonna going to head over to Hong Kong in April. Yeah, um, cool. yeah hang, out, hang out with the kids. Those guys are, they're demanding. So, you know, Paw Patrol, yeah. uh, the zoo, those are, those are some of my hobbies. Nice. Yeah, those are good hobbies. We watch a lot of, uh, what's a show called? Doc McStuffins. That's our, okay. that's my hobby these days is Doc McStuffins. Yeah, I'm amazing. Anyway, number four, <laughs> what do you believe sets apart successful real estate investors from those who give up fail or never get started? So, so I think you have to be willing to sacrifice. If, if you really want to jump in this, I gave up basically watching TV for two years. I didn't catch a football game. You know, my daughter was, was just bored when I started. And I can honestly say that I wasn't around too much for her first year. It was the sacrifice that I had to make to get to where I am. I was able to quit, you know, my job a year later. Yep. But it, it takes a lot of sacrifice. You have to be willing to make those. And it also helps to have a great support partner. Like I could not have done it without my wife being able to put up with me constantly on my phone, running around, working weekends, 16 hours a day. Um, so surrounding yourself with the right people and be willing to sacrifice. You know, I had a conversation the other day on that note with a, with a buddy of mine. And he was saying he's got a little kid at home. Uh, I mean, like a year old and uh, another one on the way. And he wants to build a real estate business. He wants to be a real estate agent. He wants to do all this stuff. But he also works in a full-time job. And he's like, I just, like, I talked to him week after week after week we talk. And he's not made any progress at all towards his real estate or investing. And he's like, well, I just, you know, I just, I feel bad leaving the kid and not being around. And I'm like, I get that. I mean, I totally do, right? We're in real estate. But you have a choice. You can be, you can sacrifice a year or two and have the next 18 when exactly. they're going to remember you. Like, I'm not saying don't be around for your kid. Be around for your kid as much as possible. But I mean, you better not be watching. If, if that's your excuse, you better be watching no Netflix at all. You better not even have a phone that you're using for anything other than texting business contacts, right? Like, I mean, there, there's a lot of hours in a week that we are not working. But, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, it drives me a little bit nutty. You can tell like, it's just like, if you really want something, you'll find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. Right? Everything is possible. Get rid of Facebook on your phone. Get rid of Netflix. Yep. If, you're, if you're a Broncos fan, don't watch the Broncos. You know, sorry. What, what do you want more? I mean, yep. what do you want more? So, uh, yeah. and something people don't talk about a lot is like, yeah, I want to be there with my kid. I want to be there for all this stuff. But if you're there as like a grumpy, unhappy person who isn't satisfied with how life is going, no kid wants that right around, right? You'd rather have a little bit less time and a happier dad or happier mom then yeah, they were at everything and they were irritated the whole time and on their phone trying to, right? So just keep that in mind. Like if you can work really hard and then give them a really good life and be happy yourself, your kid would much rather have that. Yeah. Yep. And, and if you just keep pushing, I mean, now I can take off a random Wednesday and say, hey, we're going to go do this. You know, we're going to go get yep. breakfast. We're going to, you, you know, it's, it's that silver lining at the end of the tunnel, but, but you got to you had to suffer a little bit in the beginning and make those sacrifices. And Rosie's not going to mind all these pictures of her uh, three years old playing with Uncle David on a beach with a sunset in the background <laughs> of Hawaii because Brandon so hustled where he was at. So that's yeah. a, it's a cool story. I, it's definitely something people should look forward to because real estate will pay you back for everything that you put into it. And a lot of things in life don't. All right, Colin, final question for me. Tell us where can people find out more about you? Uh, Bigger Pockets. Definitely message me on there. Um, I'm on Facebook. Instagram, kind of, uh, Colin underscore C underscore Schwartz. 
And uh, I have a LinkedIn account too. So, you know. but Bigger Pockets <laughs> well, is great. We'll put links to all that the show notes. Uh, the show notes, of course, are at biggerpockets.com slash show 318. So if you want to jump in there, they can find links to all your social media and all that good stuff. And of course, they can comment there on the show notes and talk to you and ask questions there as well. So uh, thank you, Carl. This has been fantastic. Unbelievably good. Like really like I love your story. I love where you came from. I love where you're going. So keep it up and uh, you have to come back on the show sometime and tell us what kind of when you get to the next level, how you got there. Awesome. Would love it, guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right, that was our show with Colin. Thank you very much, Colin. And thank you, David, for being a, an amazing analogist today here on the show again. <laughs> I like how you used alliteration to call me an amazing analogist. That seemed to be a theme. I know, right? Show. That was kind of a theme in today's show. It was definitely a delightful show. It, especially <laughs> the that yeah, was that fun. was really good. Yeah, he's just an awesome guy. That, that dude put together a plan and executed at a very high level. And what I love about it is it is not something that requires an MBA to do. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to send out some mailers and I'm going to do some meetups and I'm just going to network and be a, a fun, nice guy that everybody likes. And he just was like, oh, I happened to have stumbled my way into 110 units in two yeah. years. I mean, that's like such a cool story that anybody could follow. It's so true. So good. So awesome. All right, y'all. Well, thank you for listening to the show today. If you're enjoying the show, make sure as always, leave us a rating review. If you have not yet in iTunes, I know we have like, I don't know, four or 5,000, but there's like a quarter million people who listen to the show. So that means there's a lot of people who have not yet done that. I'm looking at you. Yeah. You driving there in your car. Yeah. I see you. Yep. Right there. You get, when you get home today, leave me a rating review. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please do. If you guys like this kind of stuff, uh, I started putting Instagram stories of me in my car, much like what you're doing. Oh, yeah, you have. Thoughts that I've been having. So uh, if you guys want to hear more of that type of stuff, it's kind of like an extension of what we talked about today, a lot of it. Follow me at David Green 24 Follow Brandon at Beardy Brandon. Get more of the stuff that you love because we live this stuff. And go apply to work at Bigger Pockets. If that's something you're thinking about, you should absolutely do it. You don't want to look back in 10 years and say, why didn't I? Make yeah. That- That being said, this is David Green for Brandon Bearded Blue Eyes Turner signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.